and um, I'm here from Instead and UC Berkeley. And I'm here to talk about, you know, first of all, framing this incredible opportunity which Patty began. Um, not long ago, uh, the idea that everyone would have a cell phone was, seemed really far-fetched. And in fact, cell phones were a reality only for the most wealthy and powerful people in the world. When the first cell phone came out in 1973, um, it was a foot long, two pounds, and it was $4,000, which in 2012 dollars is about $50,000. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> today's cell phones have reached uh, people across the world at penetration rates that no one would have imagined. And out of uh, about 6 billion people worldwide, 4.5 billion are cell phone, cell phone users. Many people have called it the most prolific consumer device in the history of humanity. What an incredible statement, an incredible opportunity for all of us. Cell phone subscriptions are growing, and they do dozens of things. All of us in this room have one. We use it for everything in our lives. Even this very simple Nokia that you see here is an alarm clock, a calendar. It uh, is a music player. It's a web browser. It's a camera. It's an answering service. It's a wallet. It's a map. Um, and you call people on it. The possibilities are extremely exciting. And this opportunity is something that we hope to take advantage of um, for HIV prevention and treatment. So what we did in our review is really wanted to look at the evidence, the scientific evidence. So as Peter said, it's very easy to get excited about the hype, but what's the evidence that these things are actually working? And specifically, uh, to address the HIV treatment cascade. So today in HIV, we, we know that one of the most incredible challenges of this next generation of HIV advocates is bringing the scientific advances of the last 20 years to bear in actually rolling out services across the world. So the HIV treatment cascade here describes how um, we start with education and outreach, and as we move down the cascade through testing, through linkage to care, to CD4 screening, ART initiation, and actually getting under treatment, a very small percentage of people who are eligible are finally reaching access to treatment, and even a smaller percentage of those are able to stay adherent in order to have uh, their lives improved by this incredible medical advancement that is medication. So, as we're beginning to implement these things, we find that it's a really exciting moment in, in this generation where we get to look at, at meeting the needs of 33 million people and finding treatment for them. When the rubber hits the pavement for mHealth, how can these tools help these numbers and how, uh, how can they improve the, the treatment cascade? So in order to answer this question, we pulled together a team of several people, including many people in this room, um, and uh, we used the social uh, library software, Mendeley, to review thousands of articles across the literature. Um, we pulled together literature from medicine, from global health, from engineering, from global development. One of the incredible opportunities of mHealth is it uh, pulls together expertise from a very large range of fields. At the end of the day, we found about 2,600 scientific articles on mHealth, only 62 of which were relevant to HIV AIDS. I'm going to talk about what uh, the findings of that work was today. So within the HIV AIDS literature, we find that uh, the majority of the, of the articles, we, uh, or the majority of the projects that are being described in the literature, which just to frame it, are, is only actually a small amount of what's actually happening in the world, but uh, the majority of the projects took place in Africa, about 29% of them. Uh, fewer in North America and then Latin America and Asia. Uh, the, most of the projects took place in urban locations, about 74% of the projects, and also rural locations, meaning that they have been deployed in uh, places rural and urban across the world. The vast majority of them provided services for people living with HIV. Um, a smaller percentage provided services to what they call a general population. So, for example, any patient that comes into your STI clinic or um, people in general that might be interested in receiving uh, updating, updated texts on information about HIV AIDS. A smaller number provided services uh, to providers and youth. And less than 5% of the literature describes providing services to the most vulnerable communities, uh, sex workers, men who have sex with men, and those um, communities that we know are most impacted by, the, by um, HIV and the epidemic. So how does this apply to the treatment cascade? For, so for those of us who are in the field running programs, hoping to make these advancements mean a difference in people's lives today, um, we looked at the literature across this cascade and we looked at, for examples, of how 
uh, M Health could facilitate increasing the number of people who can access these different essential services. And we assessed each, um, each piece of evidence for these main traits. We looked at whether or not, um, at the end of the day, this exciting tool of M Health actually resulted in some kind of behavior change, uh, actually resulted in some sort of health outcome. And we wanted to look at research strength, research rigor. We were interested in both qualitative and quantitative findings and feel that both are very essential, actually, to understanding how M Health works in the field. Um, so what we wanted to find is, uh, did they make valid assertions based on what kinds of methods they use? Did they have methods? And a lot of times in this field, we hear a lot of descriptions of projects, but not really a rigorous look using any kind of methodological approach at all. Did they uh, direct services towards the most vulnerable communities? Uh, were they mid medium or long-term initiatives? Do they have something to say about whether these things work beyond a pilot? Um, and the study location, did it take place in a low-resource setting? So I'm not going to have a lot of time to describe each one of the, these areas of research, but you'll see a little uh, report card at the bottom of each slide, and uh, the, the, the more checks you see, the better. So starting with HIV outreach, we found that there are two areas of research that have most impacted um, or most improved HIV outreach and education. The first is youth educational messages via SMS. And you'll hear a lot about this at this conference. Um, I saw several posters. It's an exciting opportunity. Um, there, are, there are several studies that point out that SMS sent, uh, using SMS to send messages to youth um, have been effective, that youth find it, uh, they find it an acceptable way to receive sexual health information and uh, referrals to clinics, um, that large communities of young people, primarily in the um, the wealthiest countries have been able to access health services using, these, um, using SMS in this way. Secondly, a series of projects have used mobile health uh, devices in patient waiting rooms to make uh, HIV educational videos available to people. These have been used all around the world and have found that they can increase the uh, people's knowledge of HIV um, as they're sitting in the patient waiting room. However, very few of these have gone on to find that that level of education being increased, say either through educational SMS to youth or through patient videos, very few, if any, studies have found that this actually makes an impact in people getting tested or changing their behaviors. So the next major step along this treatment cascade is getting people tested and, count and having them access voluntary testing and counseling. Um, we found only one piece of evidence around this, and that was actually a very innovative project in South Africa um, that used an HIV surveillance project to go door-to-door -door collecting rapid samples. Usually surveillance is disconnected from voluntary testing and counseling for a lot of reasons, most of all because during surveillance, they're not providing people with the wraparound services that they need, particularly uh, the, the counseling aspect. So in order to not make all of this testing go to waste, they, uh, this team gave each person uh, that they that uh, consented to be tested a, uh, an ID number that they could go to any local clinic and provide that local clinic with their ID number and receive their test results. So the project was able to um, download their testing intervention into a PDA, sync it to the PDAs at all of the local clinics so that a, a patient who was tested could go to any of those clinics and receive their results. Um, Linking to care is one of the huge challenges for, uh, for those of people who are found to be HIV positive. And we found that um, across actually the whole latter half of the, uh, of the cascade, there are two main types of M health interventions that are helpful to this whole process of linking to care and the continuum of care across it. So the first are, are those um, M health tools that support community health workers. And I'm so glad that we had a chance to hear about one of them um, from, the, uh, from Peter. Um, the community health worker tools have been found to be very, very uh, acceptable, useful, and, and facilitating of community health worker services worldwide, and particularly in underserved communities. Um, they allow for providers to track, uh, to track community health workers' um, activities and to connect the information that they're collecting in the field back to central clinics. Um, they allowed community health workers to track complex regimens, to connect to, to other providers for support when they weren't quite sure how to support uh, people living with HIV in the best possible way, and particularly to um, support community health workers around ART adherence. Um, one thing that you've heard a lot about from Patty is uh, appointment reminders, and appointments, just getting to your appointment is an essential part of any kind of 
um, chronic care service, and that's similar in every country around the world, from high income places to low income places, SMS appointment reminders, very simple text message saying, don't forget your appointment, has been found to be successful, everyone from, from, from uh, Switzerland to Uganda. Um, and they improve appointment adherence and significantly reduces lost follow-up across all of the services that someone needs to be able to access, starting with when they find out they're HIV positive, all the way to adherence. Um, finally, probably the strongest evidence in, in, um, for HIV and M health is around just treatment adherence. And as you see, this is just one aspect of an entire regimen of health services that need to be provided in country, but it's an extremely important one in the lifelong process. So within treatment adherence, there are two areas of evidence that are success, that of, of success. One is um, ART adherence reminders to people living with HIV. Um, two major clinical trials, randomized clinical trials, both in Kenya, have found that short weekly SMS are, uh, are effective. We saw a couple of posters that, that um, had differing, here at this uh, conference, that had differing results finding that daily musical reminders, for example, among my uh, non-literate populations were effective in reminding people to take their meds. Um, a lot of people who are uh, on lifelong antiretrovirals are not literate, so finding ways to communicate uh, not just through text message but through voice is an extremely powerful opportunity. And why not? It's a cell phone. That's how people use it all the time. So another really exciting, I think, and innovative possibility is using the mapping devices on cell phones. And very few M Health HIV projects use the geospatial um, possibilities of the cell phones. And one, uh, one exciting piece of evidence found that a, you know, a study around facilitating, facilitating tuberculosis care around, uh, among people living with HIV found that one of the biggest challenges for health workers is actually locating patients, especially in slums and um, in extremely densely populated areas. So by using the GPS devices in your cell phone, uh, community health workers were able to find patients more often and much more quickly. So ultimately, what happens when the rubber hits the pavement in the, in the last 10 years of mHealth? Does it help? And we find that in the beginning of this continuum, unclear, even though it's incredibly possible to use cell phones to do massive HIV education campaigns, there's no indication that this is being, there's no good evidence that this, this is being effective. In fact, it was exciting to hear some of Peter's work because it seems as if he, he has some evidence that wasn't, um, that isn't yet a part of this body of research. Um, HIV testing and counseling is an essential part of the work that we do, and you can't provide any of these services until people know they're positive. So these services, that's very, the evidence is very unclear in that area. Um, more, uh, more evidence suggests that, it, that it'll be useful for linkage to care and CD4 screening, but the strongest evidence is at the latter end of this, this uh, cascade. So what really works? Um, ultimately, there's a big uh, divide between what we know from the scientific research and what people are practicing in the field. And what we find is that these things, these factors seem to be indicated over and over again across projects, both those reported and those unreported, um, in being successful. One, engaging local leadership. M Health seems to have carried on an almost ancient um, neo-colonial mode of development. And we're bringing back the fly in, fly out uh, style of development through M Health, where an outside expert comes to a community drops off their package and then leaves. Um, maybe they graduate from their PhD program and never come back. Um, so uh, one of the extraordinary leaps that we could take in M Health is local development, local capacity building among uh, developers and designers who can um, bring those skills in country. Engaging end users in the process of development can help us to make sure that, it, that these tools are directly meeting the needs of community health workers and not just the people who pay for the, those to, for the tools to be developed, such as ministries of health or researchers. Reusability and allowing these projects to not be remaking the wheel each time is an incredible opportunity in technology that could exist very easily. Interoperability, does your M Health project that exists in one corner of the world interconnect with the vast ecosystem of information technology that's emerging in countries? Human-centered design really focuses on what the final needs of people are and designs around them. Working um, and creating projects for the most vulnerable communities has been a part of HIV work from the beginning. 
and health has been completely disconnected with that in the way that we see so few projects being directed toward the people who are most affected by the epidemic, particularly men who have sex with men, sex workers, women, even pregnant women around PMTCT. So um, instead, uh, where um, I've been based has been working to take these lessons from the evidence and turn them into platforms that are free, reusable, customizable, that are designed um, in local environments, that work in with low signals, that don't require internet, that don't require literacy, everything from voice-based reminders to text-based reminders to uh, map-based systems. One example that's a little bit different from the things that we're seeing in the literature is using maps, as I was mentioning. Resource map, which is one of our tools, allows people to collaboratively work and track their resources together. Um, people with any kind of cell phone all across a country can upload information simply to indicate where skilled providers are located, to indicate where testing is available, where ARTs are available. And uh, these projects are developed in country. So innovation labs are a part of this work um, across the world and in developing, and then this is developing as a model for how to make these tools. This is our innovation lab in um, Cambodia. Once products are created there, these um, local uh, developers become a part of the capacity building efforts, training and teaching people how to use their tools, developing them on the ground based on their knowledge of what the real needs are. So just to finish, it's only been 20 years since the popularization of the cell phone. In 20 short years, some incredible opportunities have come before us. Some of these opportunities will be extremely relevant to our work in HIV AIDS. And I'm excited to see what's next from all of you in the room. Um, so I'd want to thank my partners at the Health Informa Informatics Public Partnership and several of the co-authors of the study, including Bill Philbrick and Patty uh, Mikkel, who are both here. Thank you very much.